Hey everybody, happy Monday. Um, so today I'm going to read you guys something a little bit different. So this is a book called Big Questions from Little People and Simple Answers from Great Minds. Um, and this was put together by a person named Gemma Elwin Harris. So I thought that it might be kind of fun um, just to look through this book and see what looks like some interesting things for us to um, learn about together. So the very first one is, are there any undiscovered animals? Um, which was answered by Sir David Attenborough. So we'll start with that one, which I have not really read a lot of these before. So I'm interested to hear what the answers are. You know, actually, before we get to reading the question, I thought I'd read the editor's note. So this is, um, so this book doesn't exactly have an author, right? Because it's kind of written by a bunch of different people. So the person who put it all together um, is named the editor. So, or is called the editor. All right. So she says, my son is two years old and already the questions have started. Recently, he pointed at the moon as we hurried home from nursery and asked, what's that? For now, that's the moon. We'll do as an answer. But I know it won't be long before I'm struggling to explain what the moon is made of, how far away it is, and whether a goldfish could survive there. The questions children ask are often baffling. Chances are, if you ever knew the answer, or even part of the answer, you've probably forgotten it, or can only remember a half-baked version of the truth. Imagine if you could turn to a well-known expert at this point and get them to answer for you, in language simple enough for a child to understand. This was the idea behind big questions. So as you guys, most of you know, I have a four-year-old who asks lots of questions, so this seemed um, particularly relevant, but I also think that they, it seems interesting too, just for adults, because um, as you'll see, a lot of these things I think we don't necessarily know the answer to anymore, or um, even if we did, we've forgotten. So with the help of 10 elementary schools, we ask thousands of kids between the ages of four and 12 to send us the questions they most wanted answered. The results were fascinating and funny. There were cute and quirky questions like, why is space so sparkly? Who had the first pet? And can a bee sting a bee? Hmm. Others were fiendishly difficult. How is electricity made or where do oceans come from? And a few shot straight to the heart of a deep philosophical conundrum. Why do we have wars? How do we fall in love? And where does good come from? Among their handwritten replies, we found a lot of questions involving bodily functions. Why is P yellow seem to be a recurring concern? The mysteries of space clearly obsessed many children, and it's no surprise that animals, chickens, cows, and monkeys popped up frequently. There was even one question of great genius that encapsulated all of the above, a perfect storm of cows, bowels, and space travel. If a cow didn't fart for a year and then did one big fart, would it fly into space? <laughs> what would world experts say when faced with these questions? The response from our panel has been staggering and heartwarming. However busy, they've carved out time to co-write this book in order to benefit the NSPCC, the UK's leading child protection charity. Bear Grylls took the trouble to explain the nutritious benefits of eating a worm. Jessica Ennis emailed a mantra for aspiring Olympians just two months before the 2012 games. Darren Brown set his impressive gray matter to work on is the human brain the most powerful thing on earth, while Philippa Gregory put her latest novel on hold to shed light on why Guy Fox was so naughty. No question was too bizarre. The historian Bettany Hughes barely blinked when we asked her, did Alexander the Great like frogs? This book doesn't claim to, answer, to offer the only answers to these questions. It's an anthology of voices, a personal response from each expert to a child's idiosyncratic question. We hope you enjoy reading them with your family and take something from them, including the mental image of a cow soaring into the stratosphere powered by its own methane. Thanks to the science writer Mary Roach and her friend Ray, a real-life rocket scientist, for running the maths on that one. We will have to read that one. 
When my son asked his question about the moon that evening, I was busy making a mental list of what we had in the fridge for dinner. Lying back in his buggy, he was taking in the beautiful, the beauty of the night sky. There above, he saw a pale and ghostly globe shining in the darkness for the very first time. His question, what's that, demanded I see the full moon too. So we stopped and stared, and how strange and new it seemed to us both. Cool. So we'll get started, and we'll start with the first question, which, if you remember, was... Dun, 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 are there any undiscovered animals by answered by Sir David Attenborough, who's a naturalist? And he says, yes, hundreds, probably thousands. Exactly how many, no one can say, because they've not yet been discovered. That makes sense. If you spent a day in a tropical rainforest, swishing a butterfly net around through the undergrowth or the leaves high in the tree canopy, you would certainly collect hundreds of insects. Many of them would be beetles. Would any of them be unknown to science? You would have to ask a beetle scientist. Many he would recognize straight away, but there might be a few that would puzzle him. Would they be new species? It might take him a long time in a museum examining them and comparing them with others in the museum or pictured in books about beetles to be quite certain that he had a new species but there would probably be one. In fact, I suspect it might be harder to find a beetle scientist who would be able to do this very difficult work than to find an unknown beetle. That's interesting. Unknown big animals are certainly much rarer. Your best chance of finding one would be to go to the least explored part of our planet, the very deep sea. You can only go down there in a special deep sea submarine. There have to be extreme, they have to be extremely strong to withstand the huge pressure of the water. And of course, it is pitch black down there, so you would have to have powerful lights to do your searching. You might get a glimpse of something in their beams, but unless you could catch it and examine it in detail, you could not be certain that it was a new species. And catching animals down there is a very difficult job, needing very specialized equipment. But I'm sure there are still monsters down there that no one has ever seen before. Who knows? We will find one one day. Okay, the next one, I'm going to read this one too because I'm interested in this. Is it okay to eat a worm? Uh, answered by Bear Grylls, who is ex an explorer and survival expert. Remember that old book, of How to Eat Fried Worms? That's a, a kid's book. I can't remember why they ate the worms, but anyway, I guess we'll find out if that's okay to do in real life. Well, here's the thing. If your life depends on it, then you bet it is okay to eat a worm. But you don't want to be doing it every day, trust me. And if you do eat one, you've got to be careful because worms can have some bad stuff in their tums as they wiggle around all day underground. So it's best to cook them up. Oh, I guess you could fry them. I find if you boil them up with some pine needles over a fire, it makes them taste a little better. It does not sound good. I will never forget the first worm I ate. <laughs> I was standing there incredulous watching this soldier suck a long juicy worm up between his teeth and munch it down raw. It's disgusting. I was almost sick, but when it was my turn, I think I nearly was sick. But guess what? If you do it enough <laughs> and you're hungry enough, then it gets easier. And there is the real secret of life and survival. If your spirit is strong enough, you will find a way to do the impossible. That is the lesson of the worm. Oh, and remember, keep smiling even when it's raining. That's the second most important lesson. So get out there and explore. Well, that had kind of a nice little um, lesson in it that I wasn't expecting. All right, I'm going to go back to the table of contents and see what interesting ones we can read about. Um, let's do how our dreams made. Sounds kind of cool. Okay. How are dreams made? And this is, I don't know how to say this person's name, so I will just say it. Elaine de Baton, a philosopher. Most of the time you feel in charge of your own mind. You want to play with some Legos. Your brain is there to make it happen. 
you fancy reading a book, you can put the letters together and watch characters emerge in your imagination. But at night, strange stuff happens. While you're in bed, your mind puts on the weirdest, most amazing, and sometimes scariest shows. You might be swimming the Amazon River, hanging onto the wing of a plane, sitting down for a five-hour exam with your worst teacher, or eating a pile of worms. Relevant to what we just read. Things that you know from real life, and perhaps haven't even paid much attention to, have a habit of cropping up in dreams in full Technicolor. The man who runs the news paper stands suddenly has a starring role in a holiday you're dreaming of having taken in Zanzibar. A boy at school you never speak to turns out to be your best friend in a dream. In the olden days, people believed that our dreams were full of clues about the future. Nowadays, we tend to think that dreams are a way for the mind to rearrange and tidy itself up after the activities of the day. Why are dreams sometimes scary? It's a good question. During the day, things may happen that frighten us, but we're so busy we don't have time to think properly about them. At night, while we're sleeping safely, we can give those fears a run around. Or maybe something you did during the day was lovely, but you were in a hurry and didn't give it time. It may pop up in a dream. In dreams, you go back over things you missed, repair what got damaged, make up stories about what you'd love, and explore the fears you normally put to the back of your mind. Dreams are both more exciting and more frightening than daily life. They're a sign that our brains are marvelous machines and that they have powers we don't often give them credit for. When we're just using them to do our homework or play a computer game, dreams show us that we're not quite the bosses of our own selves. It's kind of cool to think about. Do any of you keep a dream journal? I've never done that, but I sometimes have had um, very interesting, strange dreams. And sometimes I don't remember them. Like I know that I had a dream, but I can't remember the dream. Let's see. All right, let's try. Hmm. How about why do we have music? That sounds interesting. All right. Why do we have music? So this was answered by Jarvis Cocker, who is a musician and broadcaster. And they said, that's a very good question. I wish I knew the answer. Just joking. Yes, it's true that if music disappeared from the world, no one would die. It's not like air or water. We can live without it. But just think how boring life would be if it did disappear. Discos would go out of business. Concerts would just be one big crowd of people staring at another, much smaller crowd of people standing on a stage in silence. As for musical statues, well, it would never get going, would it? Musical statues, okay. But seriously, every society on Earth has music, so there must be some point to it. In fact, some scientists think that humans were singing and making music long before they learned how to speak. Perhaps it was our very first form of communication, and it can still be a way of communicating without words today. Think about happy songs and sad songs. They both use the same musical notes. There are only 12, you know, yet are so different in mood. Ah, oh, that's because of the words, you might say. But no, try listening to the radio in a country where you don't speak the language. You'll still be able to tell the happy songs from the sad ones. It's the sound of the music that tells you. How does it work? I don't know, but it does. It, it's kind of magic, and I think that's why we have it. It's magic, and we can have it whenever we want. When you put one of your favorite songs on and get a sort of shivery feeling behind your ears and down the back of your neck, even goosebumps sometimes, that's one of the best feelings there is. I like films and books and plays and paintings, but they don't give me that same magical feeling. Only music does that, and that's why we have it. That's pretty cool. Um, so changing course a little bit, here's another question called, do aliens exist? And this was answered by Dr. Seth Shostak, who is an astronomer. Oh, excuse me. When I was a kid, I would sometimes look up at the night sky with its thousands of stars and wonder, could there be someone out there? 
today, aliens, smart creatures that come from planets we've never heard of, can be found in a lot of movies and television shows. Aliens are everywhere, it seems. But not everything you see in movies or on TV is true. So what do scientists say about aliens? Do they exist? The answer is, we still don't know. Most scientists think it's possible that real aliens are out there. That's because the universe is so big. We live in a galaxy called the Milky Way. It's a very large group of stars, and we believe that our galaxy has about a thousand billion planets. In addition, there are at least a hundred billion other galaxies we can see with our telescopes. So the number of planets in the visible universe is about the same as the number of sand grains on all the beaches of Earth. That is an enormous amount. With so many places where aliens could exist, it certainly seems reasonable to believe that they do exist. How could we find them? Some people think that big-eyed visitors from another world have rocketed across space and are flying around our skies in saucers. We've all seen those movies, right? That would be very interesting, but most scientists don't think it's true. Why? Because the saucer reports are not convincing. When you see a light in the sky, there are many things it could be. For example, you might be seeing an airplane, a balloon, or an orbiting satellite. Before scientists will believe that any of these mysterious lights are spaceships from another planet, they want better proof. Another way to find aliens is to use big antennas to try and pick up radio signals coming from a faraway world. If we could hear a broadcast from another planet, we would know that someone's out there. Looking for these signals is my job, and so far I haven't heard any alien shout-outs. But we've only begun to search. I think that by the year 2050, it's possible we'll find a signal. Then we'll know the answer to the question, do aliens exist? And the answer will be yes. So I guess it would be hard to know that the answer could be no. We can know a question mark, like who knows, or we might find out the answer is yes. And that would be pretty cool. Um, I am interested in learning about if a cow didn't fart for a whole year and then did one big fart, would it fly into space? Also, I really like Mary Roach, who answered that question. She's an author. Um, I've read some of her books, so I'm going to read that one. Um, so yeah, this was answered by Mary Roach, who is an author. It's true that cows produce a lot of gas, mostly methane made by bacteria when they break down the grass inside the cow's gigantic trash can size rumen, the cow's main stomach compartment. But guess what? Rumen gas, like any stomach gas, isn't farted. When we have a fizzy drink or a beer, the gas from the carbonation is burped out, not farted. Farts are made way down in the intestine and in cows, there's relatively little digesting going on in that part of the body. Interesting. Guess what else? Not only do cows not fart, they don't burp. Hmm. They're no fun at all at sleepover parties. Cows and other ruminants have a nifty trick that allows them to simply exhale the methane. My cow fart and burp expert, animal science professor Ed DePeters of the University of California, Davis, explained how it works. When a cow, say, or an antelope is feeling bloated and needs to make some room in her rumen, she blasts out some methane. But instead of belching it straight from her stomach, which would be noisy and might give away the animal's hiding place to a predator, she can shift things around and reroute the gas down into her lungs and then quietly breathe it out. Interesting. Very dainty. But let's not let this get in our way. Let's collect a year's worth of her methane breath. One cow produces about 187 pounds of methane in a year. Methane, by the way, is highly combustible, which means it burns easily. Perfect. We'll store all the methane in a pressurized tank and use it to power a strap-on rocket for our fearless astro cow. To see how high she'd fly, I consulted a genuine rocket scientist called Ray Ahrens. Ray tested engines for the Apollo lunar module, the spidery-looking spacecraft that carried the astronauts to and from the surface of the moon, 
and was, he says, designed on the back of a napkin in a diner in Long Island, New York. For our space-bound cow, Ray recommended a dual-nozzle engine for stability to avoid cow tipping and a super lightweight aerodynamic high-tech flying suit to reduce air resistance and look really bossy at the pre-launch press conference. <laughs> then he got to work with his rocket scientist formulas. Roy calculated that 187 pounds of methane would supply 2,000 pounds of thrust for about 33 seconds. He estimated that this would launch an aerodynamically streamlined 1,500 pound cow to an altitude of about three miles. Space begins around 20 miles, so the answer to your question is technically no. Ray was impressed anyway. This methane engine is hot. So anyway, maybe it would send a person up though. Um, okay, let's see, let's see. Ooh, let's go to what are rainbows made of? Oops. And this was answered by Anthony Woodward and Rob Penn, who are authors. Rainbows are made of light. When sunshine shines, sunlight shines through raindrops in the sky, the white light spreads out into bands of color, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. As the color enters the rainbow, it changes direction and is broken up. It's the re then reflected inside into the back of the raindrop and then broken up again into all different colors when it leaves the raindrop. For you to see a rainbow, it must be raining while the sun is shining and you have to be between the rain and the sun. It's impossible as we, uh, wait, hold on. It's impossible, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I lost my place. It's impossible to get to the end of a rainbow, which is a shame because as we all know, pots of gold are buried there. It's impossible because although your eyes can see a rainbow, it is really nothing more than light shining through water droplets. It's not actually physically there. Try walking towards a rainbow next time you see one. It just keeps moving farther away. Rainbows were only fully explained by Isaac Newton, a very clever scientist, 300 or so years ago. Before that, for tens of thousands of years, people had the maddest ideas about rainbows. Some said there were paths connecting Earth to heaven. Others thought that a rainbow was the sun god's belt, while a few thought the rainbow was an actual god appearing in the sky. One thing people have always agreed on is that rainbows are beautiful. And how do you remember the colors of a rainbow? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Try this. Roy G. Biv. Those are the colors of a rainbow. My son is very into rainbows right now. He likes to arrange a lot of things into those colors and we definitely always look for them when, um, after it rains. All right, we are gonna do, how does my cat always find her way home? So this was answered by Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, who's a biologist and author. If she finds her way home over quite short distances from places where she's been before, she's probably just remembering familiar landmarks, buildings, trees, and so on just like you would if you were going home from a familiar place. But some cats find their way home from many miles away over unfamiliar territory after people on vacation have lost them and have had to go home without them. Dogs do this too. They seem to have a sense of direction that helps them to find their way back from places they've never been before. In some cases from hundreds of miles away as shown in a Disney film called The Incredible Journey, which was based on a real life story. This is just the tip of the iceberg of direction finding abilities in animals. Homing pigeons find their lofts from far away. They do this for pigeon races all the time. Racing pigeons can fly home from 600 miles away in a single day. They can't do it by seeing their home and scientific research has shown that they don't do it by remembering the twists and turns of the outward journey, nor does it all depend on the sun's position because they can fly home on cloudy days too and can even be trained to do it at night. 
The Earth's magnetic field seems to play some part in their homing ability. A compass points north because of this magnetic field, so you can use it to tell which direction you're going in. But even if the pigeon had a compass sense, that would not fully explain it. If you were parachuted into an unknown place with a compass, it would tell you where north is, but not where home is. Migrating animals and birds achieving even greater feats of navigation. British cuckoos migrate to South Africa, crossing the Sahara Desert and leaving their children behind. The young cuckoos left in Britain are raised by birds of other species and never meet their parents. Yet several weeks after the older generation has left, the young cuckoos join together and find their way to their parents' home region back in Africa. Again, magnetism seems to play a part in migratory animal behavior, but it's not the whole explanation. I myself think that animals are connected to their homes by a field that acts like a kind of invisible elastic band. When a pigeon is released hundreds of miles from home, it circles around and then heads off homewards, as if responding to a pull. Young cuckoos inherit their sense of direction and seem to be pulled by an ancestral field, a kind of collective memory in the species. But this is just a theory. No one really knows how animals do it. All right, we're gonna do our very last question, which is gonna be, um, how do you fall in love? And that will be where we'll end off today. And there's actually three different people who have answered this question, so we'll see how their answers are different. Falling in love is different for everyone, so we invited answers from three people who've thought about it a lot. Two novelists who've written love stories and a scientist who studies what's going on in our brains. Jeanette Winterson, who is an author. You don't fall in love like you fall in a hole. You fall like falling through space. It's like you jump off your own private planet to visit someone else's planet. And when you get there, it all looks different. The flowers, the animals, the colors people wear. It's a big surprise falling in love because you thought that you had everything just right on your own planet. And that was true in a way. But then somebody signaled to you across space and the only way you could visit was to take a giant jump. Away you go falling into someone else's orbit, and after a while you might decide to pull your two planets together and call it home. And you can bring your dog or your cat, your goldfish, hamster, collection of stones, all your odd socks, the ones you lost, including the holes, are on the new planet you find. And you can bring your friends to visit and read your favorite stories to each other, and the falling was really the big jump that you had to make to be with someone you don't want to be without. That's it. P.S. You have to be brave. David Nichols, who's also an author. You can't make yourself fall in love any more than you can decide to be taller or kiss your own elbow. Try it, you see? This can be a problem. Any number of broken hearts, sadness, disasters, wars even, might have been avoided if we are capable of controlling love. Juliet could have ignored Romeo and learned to love Paris. Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn might have made this really lovely couple. In one of my favorite books called Far From the Madding Crowd, Bathsheba Everdeen tells Gabriel Oak that she can't marry him because she doesn't love him. To which he replies, but I love you, and as for myself, I'm content to be liked. Which sounds reasonable enough, but being liked isn't the same thing at all. In the end, it just won't do. Anyone can be liked. The trick is to love and be loved in return. So what's the difference between like and love? Sometimes I think of it as the difference between a cold and the flu. Colds are common, but flu is much more serious business. Some people think they have the flu and really they've only got a cold. Some people know they've only got a cold, but exaggerate and try to pass it off as the flu. I, for instance, was in a constant state of flu for a good 20 years. All I ever talked about was flu, flu, flu. Sometimes I was in flu with three or four different people at the same time. Looking back, I think I just had an awful lot of colds. You may have noticed round about that last sentence that this comparison doesn't really hold up. So while there's nothing you can do about falling in love, neither should you worry about it too much. Some things are going to happen whether you want them to or not. Your hair will go gray, your teeth will fall out, you will fall in love, though hopefully well before your teeth fall out. 
When it happens, don't panic. Stay calm. Try not to worry. Hope that they feel the same way about you. If they do, then congratulations. You'll have a wonderful time for as long as it lasts. But if they don't love you back, then that's when the trouble really begins. Sorry. All right, last one is Robin Dunbar, professor of evolutionary psychology. What happens when we fall in love is probably one of the most difficult things in the whole universe to explain. It's something to do without, we do without thinking. In fact, if we think about it too much, we usually end up doing it all wrong and get in a terrible muddle. That's because when you fall in love, the right side of your brain gets very busy. The right side is the bit that seems to be especially important for our emotions. Language, on the other hand, gets done almost completely on the left side of the brain. And this is one reason why we find it so difficult to talk about our feelings and emotions. The language areas on the left side can't send messages to the emotional areas on the right side very well. So we get stuck for words, unable to describe our feelings. But science does allow us to say a little bit about what happens when we fall in love. First of all, we know that love sets off really big changes in how we feel. We feel all lightheaded and emotional. We can be happy and cry with happiness at the same time. Suddenly, some things don't matter anymore, and the only thing we are interested in is being close to the person we've fallen in love with. These days, we have scanner machines that let us watch a person's brain at work. Different parts of the brain light up on the screen, depending on what the brain is doing. When people are in love, the emotional bits of their brains are very active, lighting up. But other bits of the brain are in charge of more sensible thinking, are much less active than normal. So the bits that normally say, don't do that because it would be crazy or switched off. And the bits that say, oh, that would be lovely or switched on. Why does this happen? One reason is that love releases certain chemicals in our brain. One is called dopamine, and this gives us a feeling of excitement. Another is called oxytocin and seems to be responsible for the lightheadedness and coziness we feel when we're with the person we love. When these are released in large quantities, they go to parts of the brain that are especially responsive to them. But this... All this doesn't explain why you fall in love with a particular person, and that's a bit of a mystery, since there seems to be no good reason for our choices. In fact, it seems to be just as easy to fall in love with someone after you've married them as before, which seems the wrong way around. And here's another odd thing. When we are in love, we can trick ourselves into thinking the other person is perfect. Of course, no one is really perfect, but the more perfect we find each other, the longer our love will last. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye to you guys for this week, and I hope everyone is having a wonderful time at home and that everybody's spending time with people that they love um, and keeping in touch with all of their friends, and it's been wonderful to be able to spend some time with you guys um, through these videos and, and just get to, um, yeah, just connect with you each week. So I hope everybody's doing well, and I would um, be happy to see you all soon. All right.